All right. So um, <clears throat> every so often I'll I'll check in with where you are in the reading just to, to make sure that everyone's up to up to speed. What I'll try to do also each time before we begin our class, because we're not going to follow the book. I mean, there's a lot of overlap and stuff, and you probably have seen that already. Um, but I, I will try to remember that before we begin to take a few moments and say, was there anything you read that, you know, one maybe, I don't, what, what in the world is he driving at? You know, or that was really intriguing. Um, you know what, I'm going to, you know, that, 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 that's influential in my thinking, and I thought it was profound. And, and uh, so I just want to interact with the reading um, as, you, as you do it, anybody. And so the, the best thing to do is as you read, you know, circle it, highlight it, underline it, dog, dog ear the page, because I'm sure if you read four or five days in advance, at least if you're like me, you'll forget where it was and what it was. But, um, but if, uh, if, it was a, if it was a profound thought for you, it's probably a profound thought for, for some of us. And sometimes if you're like me, you've, you, you read the same material and somebody said, this was really good. And I say, well, I don't remember that. And then go back and look at it and say, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. That was really good. And so, so it's just, I think it will aid, it'll aid all of us. So anybody have anything that they remember from the reading that they'd like to address, either the introduction or chapter one? Yeah, Elizabeth. Uh, Uh huh. And I thought that you had said, or at least I wrote it down, that you said that the um, observation was the most important. Yeah, yeah. So Good. Reading book. Um, Mr. Zuck thinks. <laughs> that interpretation. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. I just wondered if I wrote that wrong or if, if you just had a different. No, no. You just you need to you need you need to correct Mr. Zuck's wrong thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, he does. He, 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 he believes that the interpretation, and he doesn't really even put observation in the interpretation process of it. He doesn't really deal with it. You read in his introduction, he's going to deal primarily with, um, with uh, interpretation and application. He made a, a big deal about, but uh, yeah, good, good, good catch. No, nope, he's, he's thinking of it in that way. Um, and so, so that's part of the differences of, of, of two people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, any other observations or comments? That was a good one, yeah. Well, how old are you, Elizabeth? 18. 18. When you're 18, current probably only goes back about four or five <laughs> years. Uh, if you're as old as Jim, um, the 90s are probably still current in your mind, right? Yeah. So, uh, so it, is a relative, uh, it is a relative question. But the field of hermeneutics, I am, I'm actually going to speak about one thing <clears throat> I, I put it in my notes, and we'll get to um, sometime. That is really kind of a well. It's not. It's it's a new old issue. <clears throat> but all that to say, you know, there's always issues in hermeneutics. They're not necessarily new, but there's always kind of the big ones that people are wrestling with. Uh, and um, but it's not a fast-moving train. It's not like you know a book that's two years old is already out of date. You know, um, it's not like Nathan's, Nathan's profession is computers, you know, and so if you, you know, in four years it's obsolete. Hermeneutics is not, obviously not, not like that. It's, a, it's, it's an age-old study, so, but, uh, but good, you know, good, good check. And that was the foreword, that was the introduction by, who wrote the foreword? What was his name? Uh, Don Campbell uh, from Dallas Theological Seminary. That's where I think Zuck taught. For, for a number of years, so so good point. Anybody else? Yep. The same thing stood out as last time about the cookbook. I like the uh, like hermeneutics yeah. like a cookbook. It's easy, like you start pairing and baking of the cake on page twenty-two. Yeah. This is like serving the food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just like he, that. He had a number of kind of neat pictures, didn't he, to try to put them together and to try to think through the the differences. And you and you may say, well, that's just definitions are just definitions and 
but but it is it is helpful to to know okay I'm 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 not in the serving stage yet and I'm in the I'm in the baking stage and so I to chop an onion. Or, um, yeah so so yeah yeah he had, he had some neat uh, some neat uh, examples there I'm trying to see if I I should have earmarked some of my own <coughs> but um, had a number of things uh, and I'll and I'll actually. Actually, have another quote that I'll share with you regarding uh, <clears throat> yeah, just just a lot a lot of good statements. Some of the things that that we'll uh, maybe we'll even talk about today. Anybody else? Yep, Jim, and then we'll go to you, Charles. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have thought they were all che they were checks, checks on steroids. Yeah. You know, I don't know if any of you are if you are familiar with the Czech language. They, 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 well, they use consonants. They use all consonants. They didn't need vowels. Right. Vowels is what they yeah, didn't have. Yeah, and Czechs think vowels are, are you know are very expensive. So, buying and, yeah, buying a vowel is that's that's a Czech <laughs> that's a Czech <laughs> issue. But um, but in the Hebrew they they didn't have vowels. I think he gave an example of that, didn't he? Of yeah. Of some of the difficulties of, of uh, of reading the text and and, uh, and yeah, a lot of us don't understand it. A lot of us probably couldn't even realize how can you write a word without a vowel. That's the same thing in modern modern Hebrew. If you if you go to Israel and you see the the signs, there's there's no vowels. It's just all yeah yeah, and you, and you still read right to left, but it's but it's all consonants. You have to supply the vowels, and so it's a uh, yeah, it is interesting. So and uh, Charles. Uh, yeah, I think me what was really helpful and a good observation was that it's just good to remember that the Bible is simple enough for us to comprehend but you know the complex thought is that it's still difficult and requires rigor and I think that's part of God's design. Uh, yeah. yeah 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 good all right anyone else so let's um we're going to talk today I actually I don't know I was actually thinking maybe since we got all these screens up here, I might even bring a computer and use some screens, but I'm not sure I'm going to do that. Um, I just said a, a couple more just statements of, as to the the importance of um, of hermeneutics. Kind of maybe they fit better with last week than this week's. Um, but um, uh, you know if if. It is is the doctrine of inerrancy more or less important than than hermeneutics? No, I mean I don't even ask that. Is there a relationship between the doctrine of errancy, inerrancy, and hermeneutics? And there is. So so the question there, I guess. So the real question is, what is the relationship? between inerrancy and hermeneutics. For those who don't <coughs> believe inerrancy, you know, um, they, would, uh, they, they would say something like, well, you know, God didn't really what? Say that. God didn't say that. You know, because inerrancy means God spoken. Somebody doesn't believe in inerrancy. Well, God said this. A person who doesn't believe in inerrancy is going to say, well, God didn't say that. All right? And, and, and and I don't know if one of your authors, no, maybe not, um, talked about about the uh, you know some of, some of those things. I can't remember. Um, but how is that very similar to to a, an illegitimate hermeneutic? That one who can say God said this and he didn't. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of this the same. You know. People that have you ever heard somebody say, "Well, this is what it says, but that's not what it means." means all right, and and so they're not denying the words, but they're but they're changing the meaning, and so in in you know bad hermeneutics, um, you know is it, it's it obviously I mean it even makes things different. We are we have trained ourselves to note liberals and liberal doctrine when they say. Well, God didn't really write that. And when they say that, we just kind of tune them out. 
or we should. Okay, I know where you're coming from. Uh, we don't hold your, that, that view of the scriptures. We hold it to be divinely inspired by God and, and, and profitable for all things. And so we see that and we, and we tune them out, or we should, okay, tune them out. Uh, it's harder to tune out a guy, oh, I believe the Bible is the word of God. I believe everything about it. And, and then they pull it out and they pull out a passage and they start talking and this is what it means. And, you know, and, and they're off somewhere in la-la land. And that's harder for us to catch. But, it, but the error is the same. The error is the same. Whatever God said that he intends to get to us, we, we are no longer getting. So in, in a sense, um, you know, our, our, somebody's hermeneutic, a pastor, let's put it that way, a pastor's hermeneutic is as important as his doctrine of inerrancy or any teachers. Your hermeneutic is as important as your doctrine of errancy, all right? Um, because they, they both touch on, on, on the same issue. So I so encourage you to, to kind of uh, keep, that, uh, keep that in mind. I have a, a chart here. I've used this in, the, uh, uh, in a number of different places. I don't remember where I got it. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't create it. Matter of fact, I think I got it from my, remember I told you I, went, I took about one hermeneutics class I took four or five times. Matter of fact, you read the guy in, in, uh, in Zuck's book. He talked about uh, Ura Rodmacher, um, and, uh, and that was the guy that I listened to four or five times. I think I got this from Ura Rodmacher, but, uh, and I, I, if, again, I, it's probably not at all um, uh, observable, but, but it's a bridge with pillars underneath it, and it's entitled God's Process of Communication. Uh, and he talks on this side about the mind and the will of God and how does it get to us. And, uh, and, and he says there's a couple of steps that get it to us. One is revelation. God's got to speak it, which he did. And let's just use the Gospel of John. God spoke to John. Uh, then it's got to get transmitted to us because we don't have what John wrote, but we have copies of what John wrote. And so transmission simply means copy. The original ones are gone. So we, there was a revelation that was written down. <clears throat> it's been copied and copied and copied because the old ones are gone. Um, and then it gets translated into a language we can read because it doesn't have to get translated if you know Hebrew. It doesn't have to get translated if you know Greek. But if you don't know those languages, it's got to get translated. So that's the next kind of pillar translation, and, uh, and then the, the pillar after that um, is, uh, is interpretation. Now we have to interpret it. What does it mean? And then the last pillar that he has here is application. So there's this, there's this process that takes, you know, what God has in his mind and it gets it into our mind uh, in action. It starts with God speaking man preserving what God has said, putting it into our language, and then us understanding what it says and applying it into our life. And so there's a number of key things. There may be something just to keep in mind on a, on a secondary note, and it's really not secondary, at least it, it, it'll become more and more important, is we all know revelation is super important. I think we talked a little bit about that last week. Um, we all can imagine that, yeah, it was probably really, really important how accurate they were copying, you know, because if they're not accurate copying and we don't have anything, we don't even have the second generation of documents. We don't even have the third generation of documents. You know, well, in some, some places we probably have a third generation, but not often. So we've got lots of transmission and they better have done it well or we're in big trouble. And we actually have lots of, lots of evidence that they did do it well. But this is interesting. I don't know how many of us think that the translation we pick is important to our understanding of Scripture. But it's more important than you think it is. And, and I, I kind of harp on this a lot. Some of you know me. You know I do that. And, and I harp on these easy reading translations. People get them because they're easy reading. It doesn't mean they're good translations. Matter of fact, I hope one thing you understand or you come to understand as we, as we do this course and as we really put an emphasis on grammar, language and grammar, I mean, it's just like, that's the goal mind of interpretation, is language and grammar. And, and you want a Bible that reflects the language and grammar that it was written in. You don't want one that kind of changes the language and grammar and adds extra, all kinds of extra words and extra thoughts. And you know, a, a thought for thought translation says that we're really not worried about 
how they wrote it. I just want to kind of give you the idea of what they were writing about. And then you've just, you've just decapitated yourself with most of the hermeneutical process. And so translation is more, more important than anything. Matter of fact, if you want to do some really good Bible study, you probably wouldn't use this as your reading Bible, but put it on your list of things too. Buy a Young's Literal Translation. Young's Literal Translation. It's very old. It's not even copyrighted anymore. Um, so all you're paying for is somebody to print it. Um, it's often abbreviated, as you can s suspect, YLT. Again, not something you're probably going to read, <clears throat> but it's a very, very good literal wooden, but not, not so wooden you can't understand it. I mean, it's, you can understand it. And so um, that, that will, when, when we get to some of the grammar stuff, that'll really help you um, a lot. Again, you may not teach out of that. You may teach, I teach out of the New American Standard. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and, and I, I don't use Young's a lot because, because I can look at the Greek grammar. And so, so it's not, it doesn't, doesn't, take me that, doesn't take me that far. But if you can't look at the Greek grammar, Young is going to really, 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 really closely follow that. Um, as do a couple of other translations. The New American Standard is very close on grammar. Uh, the New King James, the Old King James actually is also too. Um, very, very close on grammar. I'm trying to think. Now, those are probably the, 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 two, the two best on grammar. So, so just put that in the back of your mind uh, as, you, as you think about um, uh, uh, studying, studying the scriptures. So what I want to talk about primarily today <coughs> is uh, literal, I'm gonna, literal versus non-literal uh, translation. And and want to talk about what they are, what we mean by it, and why it's, uh, why it's important. I think that one's got to go. Um, and um, what we mean are, are, are some of the aspects that we of literal translation, maybe the, the first one, I should have put that up here as a title, but the first one when we, when we talk about this uh, that's going to come out is we believe there is a single meaning to the text. I alluded to this last time, spoke a little bit about it. Um, there, is, there is only one meaning of, of, of the text. Uh, matter of fact, we would, we would, I think most of us would say, um, that, you know, and there's some, there's some spoofs out there on different things, movies and books about people that just use language to mean whatever, all right? Uh, matter of fact, wasn't, I, I haven't, I've never read the book, but I've been, a, a, you know, Alice in Wonderland was actually even a, a little bit along, along those lines. Um, but the, the idea that an author can speak and have a multitude of meanings, or that somebody speaking, if somebody was speaking to you, if I was speaking to you and you were trying to dialogue with me and, and, and you were listening to what I'm saying and trying to respond by what I'm saying and, and I'd go off onto something from one subject, go off onto something completely bizarre and some other area and, and, if, and if I had just all kinds of meanings, I mean, the point is you'd look at me and you'd think, okay, you, you're not normal, you're insane. We, we attribute insanity to people who really just kind of don't stay in communication where they are. They're just bouncing all over the place, changing the meanings of words, you know, and, uh, and, and that same idea is, is, true, uh, is true in the scripture. I want to give you some, uh, some uh, you know, some quotes of some, you know, of, uh, of well, this guy, this guy was uh, was actually uh, wrote the textbook that was used at Harvard. So we're talking back in the 1500s, 1600s, long time ago. Uh, and at Harvard, and, and there might be some reasons that that would be interesting right now. There is only one meaning for every place in Scripture, and he says otherwise, the meaning of Scripture would not only be unclear and uncertain. But there would be no meaning at all. For anything which does not mean one thing surely means nothing. 
Anything that doesn't mean one thing surely means nothing. Um, and that's a, that's a great quote. Do you need somebody? There's a Chrysler 200 with the splashers on in the parking lot. Anybody driving a Chrysler 200? So, thank you, Len. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this and when we, so so this idea of of absolute meaning and we've come so far from absolute meaning today because because right now we not only don't have absolute meaning we don't have absolute truth we don't have anything like that you know we've how many years have we been in the relativistic age you know it, you know this can be true to you but not true to me uh, you know we've we've been a number of years. Um, in that issue of relativity. Matter of fact, I know a guy who used to teach at the uh, Naval Acad not Naval Academy, Air Force Academy. He's a math teacher. He was, I think he was retired military too. I'm sure he was. Um, and, uh, and even mathematics, I don't know if you know this, but mathematics is relative now. At least when I was in college, you know, math was absolute, you know, other things. Real. But he says, he says, no, 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 I mean, if, if somebody gets the math problem wrong, they could still get 100% on the equation. And he was arguing for the validity of that. He says, well, if they, if they went through all the steps right, but they, they should get 100%. You know, it doesn't really matter that m maybe they, 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 they wrote down the wrong answer or did a subtraction wrong somewhere. And I'm like, that's just absolutely bizarre, all right? I can see partial credit, but, but you don't give, it's, it's not as good as good can be when, when three plus three is five, and it's not six. And, but, but we're at that point now. I found that bizarre. I don't know if any of you, and, and he was teaching that. I'm, I'm assuming it's still, still going on in the, uh, a lot of places. Uh, there was an interesting, uh, somebody, maybe some of you have heard this. I heard it one time, so I wrote it down. I, th I thought it was funny. This whole idea of, of meaning, singleness of meaning, a thorough meaning. Uh, somebody once related it to, to umpires, and, uh, and he said, in the beginning, an umpire would say something like this. Some are balls and some are strikes, and I call them the way they are, right? And he says, well, you move down the relativistic age. And the next guy says, some are balls and some are strikes, and I call them as I see them, right? And then you go a little bit farther down and they say, some are balls and some are strikes, and they aren't anything until I call them, all right? And, and there's just this moving from there's a truth to it's just all kind of relative, and it kind of depends, depends on me. And that whole philosophy, it isn't new in hermeneutics, um, but, uh, but it, is, it is adequately, um, uh, you know, exhibited in in, in hermeneutics. And so we're looking for a single meaning, okay, uh, in many applications, right, and, and somewhere I think, uh, sometimes I, I, I can't remember whether I read it in the reading you're reading or, or a different group is reading, um, but, um, but we're going to get to application later, and we, we talked a little bit about this. Application can be varied, uh, and ev but even here you gotta, you got to be careful. Because you know, we say this, application can be many things, but it can't be anything, all right? Because if it's anything, then now all of a sudden you've, act, you've lost the meaning again because now, you know, it's, it's, it's anything. So but it can be many, so we, we, we recognize that, and, and, uh, and, and that's, that's very important for us. But the meaning is single. No question about, sometimes people ask, well, what about prophecy and what about kind of future? We'll talk a little bit about that when we get in some other areas, um, but the meaning is single. The second thing, question? yeah. So this may be the multiple application, but I was trying to think of a specific example. And in Deuteronomy, you should not muzzle the ox. Yeah. Very literal, okay, don't, don't muzzle the ox. But then Corinthians and Timothy reference yeah. that in, in the context of elders. Yeah. Paint. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think you, you would I think what we would say is that there was a meaning when when Moses wrote that, and it meant what it meant. There is a principle behind that that is true in lots of other areas, and he he applies the principle. You know, the laborer is worth his hire is is another way he puts that. 
Um, and so we, we would say that the, that the original meaning of Moses had to deal with oxes. There's nothing in the context that we would think any different. And, and, uh, and later, Paul applies it in the context of men. Yeah, so good, you know, good example you know, in, in some of those things, yeah. Anybody else? And, and when, when Paul uses it, then we'd say, and in that context, Paul's meaning, okay, his meaning was pay those who are, who, are, who, are, who are bringing you the gospel so they can continue to bring the gospel. So that was, that was his meaning. Uh, the second one, and this is kind of more in, you know, directly here, is that we, we are going to talk about the literal, and we're going to search for the literal, the literal meaning. Um, I brought my, my book from Bernard Ram. Again, if you, if you really just want to get, to get bombarded with this idea of literal meaning and the importance of it, the first half of Ram, he just goes on and on and on and on. And we'll talk a, l- a little bit about, um, about his, his, um, um, his work. But, uh, but I, I, it's, it's almost funny the, the way, you know, what, La- what Ram says. Now, Ram was, what, back in 1950s. So, uh, but, but this is what he says on, on the, this particular word, literal. Um, uh, he says, and I don't think he meant to be, I don't think he meant the pun, but I see it. He says, literal. We use the word literal in its dictionary sense. The natural or usual construction and implication of a writing of expression following the ordinary and apparent sense of words, not allegorical or metaphorical. I thought it was funny because when he says, we use literal, we use the word literal in the dictionary sense. And, you know, he's using the word literal, what? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> it's, uh, it's almost tautological, you know, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's almost like, but you have to say that. You have to say, you know, you can use the word literal, but, 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 but what do you mean? And, and, and actually one of the things that Ram contests and others do is that sometimes people, you use the word literal, and they think, well, I don't know what word to use, there's different words, literalistic, uh, letterism, that, that you, you, you don't account for, um, for figurative, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but you only, uh, you only take it if, if the Bible calls Herod a fox, then, then you're saying that Herod is a four-legged creature with a furry tail. And, and this is really the area where, again, there's been a battle here for a long time. And this is where, I think in the last two, three years, uh, this has, in my opinion, reared its head uh, in our circles, in what we would say literal, single meaning of Scripture circles. And there's this, this new, um, I'll call it an assault, I think it's, it's, it's true, on those who say, you know what, the Bible says what it says, and it means what it says, uh, and, and that's how we need to understand it. And in our circles, there's an increasing attack, and matter of fact, terms such as, um, well, you're just a biblicist, right? And I'm not talking about from the liberal camps, I'm talking about from inside conservatism, um, that you're a biblicist, you're, you're committing, you know, the, the, the term, and maybe some of you have probably heard it, um, uh, bibliolatry. Bibliolatry. I can't even spell it. But, but idolatry of the Bible. All right? uh, and I've heard it come up in, in some very unfortunate places, uh, even in issues like, you know, uh, you know, the Scripture is pretty clear on, 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 on the issues of divorce and remarriage. Uh, they're pretty clear on some of these kind of fundamental issues uh, of, of, of relationships and some of these counseling areas are starting to say, well, you know, that isn't really what it meant. It's like, well, that's what it says. Well, you're just being a literalist, you know? And so it's become a derogatory thing to say, okay, the Bible says this, it was talking about this, it's clearly what it meant. And we need to confine our meaning here. And so it is, it's becoming, I think it's becoming under, 
under um, uh, under attack again, uh, and uh, and we'll probably see it a, a little bit um, a little bit more. You remember when you read Zuck uh, in in the foreword to the book, the same thing that Elizabeth was referencing earlier. The, the guy who wrote the foreword, uh, he you know he made the statement: "We believe the correct method of interpretation." to be the literal method which approaches the scripture in the normal, customary way in which we talk, write, and think. It means taking the scripture at face value in an attempt to know what he said. That was on page 7 of, of your inter, um, introduction. Uh, Ram, in his book, he quotes a guy from the 1700s, Alexander Carson, you probably know who he is. He says, No man has a right to say as some are in the habit of saying, the Spirit tells me that such or such is the meaning of this passage. How, he, how is he assured that it is the Holy Spirit and that it is not the spirit of delusion, except for the evidence that the interpretation is the legitimate meaning of words? You know, you know, the, the, you know the Spirit tells me this is what this means. And you know, his point is, that's just, that's just bizarre. How, you know, how do you, so how do I know what spirit is, is talking to you, right? Unless, you know, that's the ordinary meaning of the words. And we're going to talk more about that as we get to, you know, a historic issue of, of, allegor, of allegorizing, which is, you know, non-literal um, to, the, to, the uh, to the greatest extent, and that's exactly what happened. Um, when we say, some people would say, well, well, you know, God didn't intend for the Bible to be, to be literal. He intended it to be, to be something other than literal. Um, matter of fact, this comes up a, a lot even in some of the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the references even to, to, to the prophetic words. Because even in our circles, we have, we'll talk a little bit later about the return to a literal understanding. And, and this is a little bit of a gross overstatement, but, it, but it's pretty close that uh, the Reformation brought us back to a literal usage of the Scripture from an allegorical one um, in, in all areas except eschatology. And, and, and you know, the Roman Catholic Church had an allegorical understanding of eschatology, and most Reform churches today still have a very spiritual understanding, non-literal understanding of eschatology. They say, well, you're not supposed to take it that way. It's figurative. It's... It's not meant to be taken literally. And, and the, the problem with that is when you look at how the Bible takes its own prophetic word, it always takes it kind of literally. So every example we have in the Bible where there was a prophecy that became fulfilled in another age of the Bible, it's not an end time, it was you know, the coming of Christ, you know, that, he would be, that he would be a Nazarene okay, or something like that. And the Bible always looks at its own interpretations literally. That's true in the prophetic word. Uh, it's true in, in a number of, of, uh, of different areas. And I just got some simple ones here. God tells Noah to go build an ark. And what does he do? Noah understands God at his word. And he doesn't think of some, okay, well, what does he mean by ark? Sometimes we even wonder how do you even know what an ark was. Um, but, but he does it. Um, you know, um, God tells Abraham, get up and go to a land I will show you. And Abraham gets up and, and he leaves. And as you, as you look through the, the, the scriptures, um, everywhere you look when the scriptures, when God speaks, people are doing, at least it tells us they're doing exactly what you would assume they would do if God spoke to you. And so, so the scripture itself, as, a, as, its own, as its own kind of example, it exemplifies for us kind of a literal, this is what he said, this is what he means, um, idea. And so that gives us a great deal, should give us a great deal of, of confidence that we're not, we're not creating a false a false kind of idea. Well, we're kind of literal guys. They're allegorical guys. Who knows in the end who's right, right? Um, that's what some people would say, and I, and I think we'd say no. I mean, it's it's pretty clear. You know, if this is this, this is the only way you can understand writing, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And it seems to be the way that the Bible understands itself. 
When the Bible is looking to interpret itself, it takes it literally. So, so I, we're not just on strong ground with these type of, of, uh, of ideas. We're, we're really on, on the only ground. Uh, any questions before we go on to allegory? I want to talk a little bit about allegory. Some of you, anybody? Are Seth? We have a, are we going to have a separate class on eschatology? Not in this class. There, um, we will, we, I think, did I devote a section to, to prophecy? Some of the, because this is a hermeneutics class, and so we're going we're gonna to stick with, I don't, I don't have that much detail in my outline. Uh-huh. When, when you say literal, are you thinking there's literal woman in the desert, a literal dragon, a literal, like, yeah. four-part four statue with the steel and the clay and the... And, and, and we, will, we will address that issue. See, that's, that's where people hold the thought. And if we don't get to it today, we, we will. But if I forget it, um, and I'll just, I'll just wait till we get there. So, but good, good question. Um, allegory. Let's talk about allegory real quick. Anybody know what allegorical allegory is? Allegorical interpretation um, in, in the sense of the church of Jesus Christ, history or, or not? Anybody? Is there like a hidden meaning in the text? Yeah, a deeper, deeper. Deep, a deeper meaning in the text that this is what it says, but it's, it's really not talking about this. It has a deeper spiritual meaning. Now you have your surface meaning, that's kind of, kind of the crude one. Um, you may have, a, have an emotional meaning, but the real meaning is this deeper, this deeper spiritual one. Uh, allegory did not begin in the Bible. All right? um, actually, if you go back, allegory, was a, is, it, is an, it is a hermeneutical principle that people use. You know, again, it's in contrast to this. Matter of fact, it will absolutely take over take over the church for a number of years, but it goes, well, I don't know how far back it goes. We know it goes back to Greek mythology, okay, in the sense that, you know, a lot of those Greek gods were pretty wicked. Um, and when you get to the age of, the, the Grecian age of the philosophers, the Plato's, the, the, the Aristotle's, the guys who, who weren't into all the degenerate, decrepit immorality of the gods, um, but they were still highly influential. What they began doing is they began allegorizing the actions of the gods into kind of, uh, you know, moralistic, philosophical reasons and, and, or, 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 or ideas. And the idea was, okay, we can't, we can't take these guys at face value because if we take them at face value, they're pretty wicked. Therefore, they don't really mean that's not the real meaning. The, the meaning is, is, is below that. So that's kind of the, the first stage of it. The second stage for our purposes are uh, when, when these guys, the, the, the Greek philosophers and the moralists and, and the guys who were, who were thinkers, not just the, the brute um, you know, adulterers in, in much of, of, uh, of, of Greek and Roman thought, uh, that they would look at... They would look at the scriptures, the Old Testament here primarily, we're talking about before Christ. They would look at the Old, at the Old Testament, these kind of intellects of their day, and they would, they would kind of look down their nose. And they'd say, you know, your God is kind of, kind, of, kind of wicked. You know, he does this, he kills people. And they'd read the story of Judah and Tamar, and they'd say, look at this, this is incest. Are you telling me that this is a holy book? And so a guy by the name of Philo, a very old, one of the old Jewish teachers, you know, he begins to employ the allegorical method of interpretation with the Greeks to say, well, that's not really what's going on here. And so that's kind of when allegory gets its kind of foot into what we would say biblical interpretation. And, and these, this is a real simplistic understanding of it, obviously. Uh, it takes another step forward when we get to the time of the, like we are in the book of Acts, the, 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 the early church takes another step forward when the new Christians are trying to prove to the Jews that Christ is all over the Old Testament. He's everywhere. And, 
And in order to do that, and that's even a modern hermeneutical principle, that people still try to, try, to, try to say Christ is in every passage, and, he's, and, uh, and we can talk about that later, but you don't want you, you to take that position. It's an untenable position. Um, and Christ is in everything, and he's everywhere, and everything talks about Jesus. And so they would begin allegorizing all of the Old Testament to show to the Jews that it points towards towards Christ, and that it's at that point that allegory enters into what to the stream of Christian thought, uh, and and there were these these two schools. Some of you probably are familiar with this. There was these two major theological schools in the early church. Uh, one of them was in in Antioch, uh, that's in Syria, and the other was in Alexandria, and they they went completely different directions and there's some church history guys here that are that are that are interesting matter of fact the name of John Chrysostom is uh, is associated with Antioch and he, he just he's, he's a great guy he should read some of his old sermons you think he was preaching today he's just a great exegete and um, and uh, Clement oh, which Clement was it uh, the, the the head of the church in um, uh, I have it here somewhere. Um, the head of the church, it was Clement of Alexandria. Well, that makes sense. Clement of Alexandria was the head of the school of Alexandria. And, and, and this particular school had stayed with a literal, kind of the way that the scriptures was read, was understood. This particular group followed more Philo. Remember, Philo was the Jew that was trying to entice the Greeks uh, and they began allegorizing, uh, allegorizing the scripture, in order to in order to win, to win the lost, to to win the outsiders. You know, so the motivation wasn't bad; it was, the process was bad. And after Alexander or Clement of Alexander, the next head of the school was a guy that some of you may be familiar with. His name was was Origen. And Origen is, if you ever want to, you know, Origen is the father of allegory. Clement, he wasn't the first guy to use it, but Origen made it prevalent throughout, throughout all, of, all, of, all of the study. Uh, and matter of fact, Origen eventually, or the school of Origen, eventually wins over the, I think it's legitimate to say, the greatest theologian of the early church, all right, anybody know who he was? I want to take a shot in the dark who he was. Greatest theologian of the early church. Augustine, Augustine clearly. Mm -hmm. And Augustine, in the early years, seemed, if we read, he, he left a lot of documents. We got lots of things of Augustine we can read. In the early years, he was, he was moved primarily towards the school of Alexandria. I'm sorry, uh, Antioch. He had a literal understanding. But he eventually gets swayed, for some reason, into the allegorical method of interpretation, the allegorical philosophy of interpretation, that's probably a better one, you know, the school of Alexandria. And, and Augustine, Augustine takes that process of interpreting the Bible, and because of his just sheer weight in the early church, it becomes the ecclesiastical norm, you know, right? And it drives the church for the next, well, when, when I say the church, I'm, I don't mean every, every, every nose in the church, but it drives the church for the next, uh, Augustine was what, 350, 400, drives the church for the next millennium. Yeah. What's an example of a story in the Bible? That yeah, I've got a couple, got a couple. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, for, let me give you a couple of, couple of examples of allegory. Some of these may say, well, I kind of I thought that was a good idea. Um, a, an allegorical understanding of Genesis 3 is that the sin of Adam and Eve was sexual. Right? That's really what was going on. That's, only, that's a mild allegory, that eating the, eating the forbidden fruit was really you know, intimacy, uh, and, that was, and that was the sin they have. An allegor, one of, and again, it's, these are just examples because one of the problems about allegory is everybody goes a different direction. There isn't a standard allegorical interpretation of things. But these are examples of where people go. Um, it, it is, some people like in Esther, um, they would say that it isn't a book of what happened to the Jews 
during the, during the uh, dysphoria, that Esther is really meant to be understood as the church, Haman is the devil, and Mordecai is the Holy Spirit. And so it's this drama of the battle of the church and with the Holy Spirit trying to protect the church from, from Satan, the devil. Uh, one that a lot of people, uh, you know, you have probably sang the children's song, you know, his banner over me is love. How many of you have sung that children's song? His banner, great little song, nice little ditty. Comes from which book? Solomon. Song of Solomon. And it's part of an allegorical understanding that the Song of Solomon is not about a husband and wife marital love. It's about the love of Christ for his church. That's the real meaning of the book. That's an allegorical understanding of, of, of the Song of Solomon. Um, you, know, you don't see that anywhere on the surface. You have to say, well, no, the surface is Solomon and his Shulamite, you know, bride, but that's not really the, that's not really the message. The message is deeper uh, than that. It can be fun to go back to origin and to read, you know, origin story of the, um, uh, you know, oh, oh, what's the one, um, the guy who was beat up along the road, the Good Samaritan, you know, and, and who's the Good Samaritan, and who's this, and who's that, and, and what all's going on, and, and they're, they're, they're literally... Um, all over the place. Did I have, did I have a, uh, I, I, yeah, I'll give you one example. This is from Origin, and it, it's maybe not the best example because it's even hard to follow even if you have it written in front of me and, and you all are going to just listen. But this was uh, when or, the sacrifice of Isaac um, in the Old Testament, uh, Origin understood it this way. Abraham, when he came to the place which God told him on the third day, looking up, saw the place afar. Now that's historical. The Bible tells us that. Third day, he came to the place, looked up, saw the place afar. So that's the, that's the history. That's the, the kind of this level. But, but what's the real deeper meaning? For the first day, because he was there on the third day, so there was a first, second, and third day. For the first day is that which is constituted by the sight of good things. The second is the soul's best desire. On the third, the mind perceives spiritual things. The eyes of understanding being opened by the teacher who rose on the third day. The three days may be the mystery of the seal, and uh, he was talking about baptism, in which God is really believed. It is consequently afar off that he perceives the place, for the reign of God is hard to obtain, which Plato called the, the reign of ideas, having learned from Moses that it was a place that contained all things universally. I don't get where he's going at the end. But it is just this, you've got some ideas, you want to teach them, and they just kind of fit, and you just go wherever you want. And, and although most people don't adopt an allegorical, I'm, a, I'm an allegorist, you probably have been in lots of churches where you say, you know what? That was allegory. <laughs> what I just heard was allegory because I don't know where he got that and, and he went off into all kinds of... Matter of fact, I think probably one of the greatest allegorizers um, of, of late, um, uh, who was a guy who's been defunct for, because of his immorality, Bill Gothard. Bill Gothard was an allegorist. You know, he, he may have said something good at one time or another, but he never said it right. Because he would take whatever passage and he would go wherever he wanted to it with it, and 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 the problem there is, when you have something like that, you say, well, that sounded really good. That sounded like you know, like uh, Origin. The, the interesting thing about Origin, Origin was, he wasn't a bad guy. Origin kept the kept the purity of the church in a time when it was about to go under. Um, he he was a courageous, given committed guy. So, so he wasn't a bad guy. He did a lot of good. He just, he, he ended up doing a lot of bad. Um, and, uh, but, but, um, uh, but a guy like, uh, what was his name? Gothard. You just sitting back there and I had a pastor one time when we were in, still in the Marine Corps and it was this way. He was, you know, he, I think he said mostly good things, but you know what? In the end, I couldn't, I didn't really know. Because it wasn't in, it was just his thoughts. He'd read a text and start talking and as if it was out of the text. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Um, and, you, and you never know. It's a, it's a hit and a miss. You know, that's what the one guy was saying. How do I know what spirit's talking to you? 
unless you're using the plain literal meaning. Then I can say, now wait a minute, that isn't what this looks like. You know, that's a, that's a noun there, it's not a verb. You know, that, that word means this, it doesn't mean that. You can't use that with that word, that's not what that word means. So, so there's, there's no checks, no bounds when you have a, any non-literal um, uh, interpretation, even, and I'm not, I don't want to bash, you know, reformed all-millennial theology, but, but you, you, there's, again, there's, there's, there's no bounds there. It, once you start interpreting things, um, in a sense, simply spiritually, that they're not meant to be literal, it's like, okay, so, so where, where do you end? And, 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 and again, I'm not arguing, well, you'll see that, that it's, it's a hard thing. There's, there, there, there's a spectrum of gray that exists, and we've got to recognize that. Um, but the best thing that's going to keep you set is a literal, you, you just, you strive for this in every way, shape, and form. Matter of fact, one of the things we say in Diddy that probably some of you have heard, all of you need to remember, is when the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. If it makes sense the way it's written, just leave it there. Um, and that will do you more good than, than almost anything else. If the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. Um, and, and, and a simple example of that, just to kind of stay on the eschatological issue, in the book of Revelation when it says, and Christ will reign for a thousand years, you could say, Does that, can that make sense? I mean, could it be something different? Well, I guess it could be, but, but it seems to make sense, and it seems to fit. So, so why would I not take it that way? Um, and, um, and again, these are harder subjects than I'm making them sound, and I don't want to, I don't want to sit here and pick at guys who can't defend what they're doing. There's, there's reasons. They're intelligent guys. They, they do things for a reason. But, um, but, but, this is, but it, 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 it revolves around this issue. Are we driving for a literal meaning? Not a literalistic, which we've got to get to with what Seth was talking about, but a literal meaning. Jim, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just, I found Origen's uh, interpretation, allegory of uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Oh, did you? G give, us, give us a couple minutes of it. Yep, it says, uh, in, in his allegorical view, the man who is robbed is Adam. Jerusalem is paradise, and Jericho is the world. The priest is the law, and the Levites are the prophets. The Samaritan is Christ. The donkey is Christ's physical body, which bears the burden of the wounded man. The wounds are his sins, and the end is the church. The Samaritan's promise to return is a promise of the second coming of Christ. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you, you see all that, you say, well, there's a lot of good theology in that, right? There's a lot of good theology, but it doesn't come from there. And, and, and I don't know where it does come from. And if I don't know where it does come from, I'm not even fully sure it's good theology. So, so it's, you know, and, and it, just, it, 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 lo it just loses any bounds to go anywhere. And what happened historically with the church is with Augustine's kind of imprimatur, pun intended, imprimatur of, of, uh, of, of uh, allegorical thought, it plunged, you know, the Catholic Church took that. When you take, I can make the text mean whatever it means, and then you give ecclesiastical papal authority to it, all right, you now not only have people confused, you have them enslaved, all right? because I am here to tell you what it means, and only I know what it means. Right? And it plunged the church into the Dark Ages. Almost all the abuses of, of Roman Catholicism and the foolishness that they hold to, uh, most of that was, was cemented, a good deal of that was cemented in this time. And, it, and the Reformation, uh, you may or may not know this, but, but you, need, you need to know it, the Reformation started on a return to literal understanding an enlightened understanding of, wait a minute, we got to go back to the source documents and see what they say, you know, and understand what they, we need to put the language in the vernacular so people can read it, we can understand it, and we can, and, and we can read it as, as a normal writing. And when they did that, you know, then everything just opens up and you're like, wow, well, this isn't as hard as I thought it was. This kind of makes sense, you know, and, 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 there, and it just, it's, it's, it's spawned the Reformation. Now, I don't, I don't want to, you know, what, what we should recognize is before Luther, there were guys who were doing this, kind of precursors to Luther. Wycliffe is probably the best one. But there were even some other, some other if you study church history, even 100, 
200 years before Whitcliffe, we see just places where people wouldn't let go of it. But in large, the church had adopted this allegorical kind of, the text can mean whatever we say it means, approach, and it ended up just devastating the church. And it still devastates the church uh, to, this, to this day. We don't usually call it allegory. We call it other things. Um, but it's, it, it is, uh, it is, um, it's just, as, just as wicked. Uh, let me give you <laughs> um, uh, some, um, some of the things that, about the Reformation. Some quotes from Luther on allegory. And understand, when I, when, you know, allegory was a real thing. Um, but there, there, is a, there is a philosophical allegorist and then there's a practical allegorist, all right, who, who wouldn't call himself an allegorist, but he treats the scripture the same way. So, um, but uh, Luther said some of these things about allegories. And you know, Luther, Luther didn't generally check his words real often. I mean, he didn't. He said, allegories are empty speculations and as it were, the scum of the Holy Scripture. Origen, you'd like this, Jim. Origen's allegories are not worth so much dirt, <laughs> according to Luther. Um, to allegorize is to juggle the scriptures. Um, allegorizing may degenerate into a mere monkey game. Allegories are awkward, abusive, inventive, obsolete, loose rags. Calvin called them frivolous games. Uh, and uh, Calvin said of, of Luther that they torture the scriptures in every possible sense um, from, uh, from, from the true sense. So they had some, some really, really uh, strong words. Um, that last one was, was uh, Calvin, John Calvin. Um, Didn't he allegorize that the, the ark was the, ark was the church, Luther? Um, I, don't, I don't know that, if that's, if that's the case. The yeah, yeah. Um, so... The literal method, which we're, which we're, which we're advocating, all right, you know, the, that's, the, that's the bad, the bad side. The literal method, now here's a definition from a, a different book. The customary, socially acknowledged designation of a word is the literal meaning of the word. The customary, socially acknowledged designation of a word is the literal meaning of a word. That was Dwight Pentecost, for those of you who, 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 know, who know him. Uh, it's not a letterism, kind of like we're talking with, uh, with uh, Seth there. Um, and, uh, and we'll give some examples of that. Uh, it is what you would say a, a common sense understanding. And when we talk about literal, we have a figurative literal, and a non-figurative literal. And, and we'll spend a whole class on figures of speech, and figures of speech are, are really fun to, to talk about. But, but figures of speech, um, uh, figures of speech, all figures of speech have a literal meaning. Uh, the, the, easy, the easiest one is, you know, if, if, if Chase comes up to me, you know, and, and he's huffing and puffing, and he says, you know, I'm gonna clean your clock, you know, I am not thinking about that thing on the wall. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of here <laughs> before, before he gets a hold of me? It, it's a figure of speech. He's not going to clean my clock. But there is a literal meaning. And, and that's what we mean by, by, by a literal understanding. What does everybody understand who's sitting around Chase, who knows what that idiom means in our language? We know exactly what it means. Now, now. We did have a clock guy come out to our house who, you know, can't find many people who do grandfather clocks. And we had a guy come all the way out from Kansas City to clean our clocks, our grandfather clocks, all right? This was a couple of years ago. Right? You remember that? And I was not at all worried about this guy because he was also a small guy, too. So, <laughs> but, but that was a, that was a non-figurative literal. There is, a, the expression also has a figure, but it's just as literal. The, both of them were very, very clear in what, in what, in what their, their purposes were. I mean, you know, we, you know, and so figures of speech 
in their, in their natural customary use have a literal meaning. That's, that's what we're looking for. You know, when the Bible says Herod's a fox, we don't, you know, nobody thinks, oh, that Jesus was such a silly guy or, or you're such a silly guy if you say you're a literalist. So do you really believe he was a, he, he was a fox with four legs? No, I don't believe that. But I believe he was a cunning, wicked, deceptive guy. And if you have a cute, if you have a cute view of foxes, you've never had chickens, right? <laughs> if you've ever had chickens, you do not have a cute view of foxes. They are not fuzzy little animals you want to buy for your child's crib, right? You want to... <laughs> every fox you can get your hands on. They kill for no reason. They come in and kill all the chickens and then walk out and don't, don't eat a one of them, you know? So they just... So, so foxes are not, they're bad. And that's what he, that's what he meant. Uh, the primary benefit of the literal method, um, and, and, and maybe that's the wrong title to have on that, but, I mean, the primary benefit is the right method. All right, that's the, that's the primary, but, if, but in, in taking out the obvious. Um, you know, it removes from the interpreter the ability to go wherever he wants to go. It puts chains on the interpreter, and there needs to be chains on the interpreter and say, you are not free to do with this whatever you want to do with it. You are not God. You don't speak for God, origin. You don't speak for God. God will speak for himself. And this is what he said, right? And this is what it means. And it, put, it, put, it puts chains on the interpreter to make sure that he doesn't become and thus saith me instead of thus saith the Lord. Uh, it puts vehicles in the, in the hands or tools in the hands of those who hear to be good what? Bereans. You know, we say that in Acts, you know, they were good Bereans. They were, they were checking these things out, all right? Um, are they so? It puts a means of test and evaluation. Um, and a test and evaluation of, of, of things that we all possess innately as, as in the image of God. We all possess communication skills, like we talked about. And it better fit normal, natural communication skills even figures of speech that we use, but it better fit. And if it doesn't fit, then, then there's some hocus pocus going on here somewhere. And, uh, and, and it, gives us, it gives us tools to, uh, to, um, um, to check. And, and obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's, it is the only way that you are going to get um, that you are going to get um, the meaning. Some common they're not allegorizes, but, um, but some common allegorical type of, of things, or I shouldn't even say allegorical, um, but some tom common non-literal approaches to the Scripture. That's the best way to put it. Common non-literal approaches to the Scripture. One non-literal is allegory. Um, I mentioned an, another non-literal, Bill Gothard, kind of his spiritualization what can you learn from the eagle? You know, what do you get from these character, you know, sketches? And, and again, if, if, if you were a fan of Bill Gothard, you know, he, my dad was saved under Bill Gothard. My dad got saved at a Bill Gothard conference, so I'm greatly indebted to, to that because it changed our whole family. Um, but uh, but Gil, Bill Gothard was like Origen. Um, well, he wasn't like Origen. Origen was a holy man. Gothard wasn't. You know, that, that became clear later. But, uh, but, um, but you know, he, he, uh, you know he, said, he said a lot of good things, but he didn't, didn't get it in the right place. Uh, a principalizing of, uh, of Scripture, kind of the self-help principalizing is, is, is kind of the same, uh, the same idea where, uh, and again, one of your, some book I just read today, I can't remember which one it was, um, when, um, when the application is confused with the meaning, you know, did, 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 was that in our books reading for today? The application gets confused with me. Now, where, where did I read that? I don't remember now. Um, you know, when you confuse the application with the meaning, um, if you, you know, uh, then what you do is you, you change the meaning of the text. 
It's, it's one thing to say, okay, here's what the text means, and here's a way you should apply it. But if you, if you take an application, this text means that you shouldn't whatever, do whatever, then all of a sudden you've went further. It's like, no, that isn't what that text means. That text means that you are to be a certain way, an application of that, maybe a good husband, husbands love your wives. This may be simple and, and, and simple. That text means that you are to court your wives, okay, and take them on dates. That's what that text means. It's like, no, that's not what that text means. That text means that husbands are to love their wives. And one way you can love your wives is by doing this. And you've got to keep those two things separately. Um, and you, know, you can think of all kinds of reasons why, but, but a very easy reason why is, huh, well, I take my wife on dates. I guess I got it. You know, I've got it done. That's all I have to do. Take my wife on a date and I have struck at the heart of this particular text. It's not like you're just dealing with one side application okay, of the text. And so we got to, as we get in, into application, we've got to, um, um, to, to remember that. And, and one area of, and again, fighting amongst brothers, sparring. Sparring amongst brothers. One of this, this particular aspect is what divides you know, kind of a, a you know, premillennial eschatology, as, as, as we hold here in the church, from the, the, the typical Reformed amillennial eschatology. We, we say when, when the New Testament says church, it means church. When it says Israel, it means Israel. We don't think Israel is a church. We don't think the church is Israel. They seem to be two different things. We think when it talks about a thousand years, we believe a thousand years. And so, so and, and, and that's not allegory, that's, you know, it's, it's, but in, in the area of eschatology, because of a theology, their theology um, kind of drive, you know, the, 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 that, that you can sometimes leave, this is what I'm trying to say, you can leave a literal meaning for the sake of your theology, okay? And, uh, and, and again, we shouldn't do that. All of our theology should be on the table, and if, if a literal understanding of the Scripture questions our theology, we should be ready to throw it out. But you know, we, all, we all have a problem with that. But there are some systems that have a theological stance that these things are not meant to be taken literally, at least not primarily. I'm, you know, again, I don't want don't to create straw men here. Um, but they're not primarily literal things. They are... They are, they, are, they are figurative or, or, or spiritual, and so sometimes our theology can drive us those, those, those directions. But, but we want to stay as far, far away from that um, as we can. Okay, uh, parting thoughts, ideas, questions, comments, disagreements, um, anything. Dan? I like yeah. Outside of scripture. Uh huh. But for a, a biblical allegory versus symbolism, like specifically in the Old Testament, with Abraham and Isaac, the ram was caught in a bush of thorns that represents Jesus as crown of thorns. Yeah. Is that allegory or is it, how do you. It's not. I mean, to say that is allegory, right? You know, yeah, and, 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 and we don't want to go. It's interesting. Allegory, Pilgrim Pride was a great example of good allegory. There are lots of good allegory out there. We say, you know, this, is, this, is, this is allegory. And we know allegory is a genre. We know how to understand Scripture. There's a, the scripture a couple times even says, and I say this allegorically. It, it tells us that the author is, is thinking in those terms. And so it's, it's not illegitimate to to write allegory, to have allegory. Of course, a lot of people, you know, what's his name? Bunyan got a lot of heat from a lot of people because he wrote an allegory and they said, don't do that, you're going to lead people astray because of history. I don't think he did. Obviously, obviously history has shown that Bunyan was right, they were wrong. Um, but um, um, but you, the problem is, is when you take that interpretation for that one genre, allegory, and you say, it's the, key, it's the interpretation for all of this other stuff that isn't written allegorically, okay? 
Um, you have to read Pilgrim's Progress because he tells us he's out. If you don't read it allegorically, you'll never get the meaning. You don't read the book of Acts as an allegory. It isn't written as an allegory. And so, so we, you know, there, so there's a place for it, um, but only where it is declared to be, to be such. Yeah. In, in general, in this particular area, when we get to the idea, when we get to, this, to the area of literary genres, uh, which is, I think, a really fun subject to think about, um, genres help us a lot in this scale of hardcore facts to, to figurative language. You know, the Psalms are filled, and that's just, that's just part of the Psalm genre, is to be hyperbolic, um, but it's not part of Acts genre to be hyperbolic. To, I, sh I cried a bed of tears. You know, David says that, and, and we all know what it means because it's an emotive psalm. Uh, you know, if Peter doesn't say that when he's describing what happened in the jail, you know, you know we cried a bed of, you know, so there's, so genre, author kind of help, will help guide us a little bit. And we'll, and we'll spend a lot of time there as an important subject. So. When I think of allegory and, and italic as the Bible is a big meaning, um, I think a lot of numbers. How are you yeah. interpreting numbers? You mean, th yeah. Just, just number it and just like, oh, well, this number. It's yeah. It's usually going to that when you're talking about yeah. a thousand years. But yeah. in this situation, I mean, that, that's something that yeah. I and, and, so, and so you have to make these determinations because numbers have figured, they, they are used as, as in, they, we, you know, they seem to be at times used figuratively. You know, seven, you know, why seven days and, and not eight? Well, well, we don't know, but it's seven. But it does seem to come up that every time something is perfect, it seems to revolve around the number seven. Now, some people then take that and go crazy with it, but, but we, have, we have to wrestle with that. You know, there are, there are seven lampstands, and why, why seven? And so we got to think through that. There's times when, when, when numbers, numerology, has, has a, had a literal meaning, and in, in, it's a little bit harder for us to grasp because we don't have a lot of rules on that. Um, so so there's, there's, a place, there's a place for it. That's part of that art. You know, there's rules, and then there's the art. And, and that's what some people say about the 1,000-year millennium. Well, 1,000 is just a long time. That's all he means by, by a thousand. And that's a possible, but, but it doesn't seem like the probable understanding there for, for, lots, of, so for lots of reasons. So that, and that has nothing to do with the numerology that some of these knuckleheads get into with you know, the Bible and go around here and, and yeah, codes and all that stuff is just, is just you know, absolute foolishness. You know. but, but there is some meaning there seems to be some consistent meaning in, you know, the, the, the sign of the beast, 666, the mark of man. Um, and you say, well, why 666? And, well, you know, man is one step short of, of perfect, you know, one step short of God. Maybe that's what it is. It's, it's highly exalted, but, but not God. And the mark of the beast, you know, we don't, we don't know. So maybe there's some of that stuff that helps explain some of those things. But is that, is that at all, Caitlin? Okay. <laughs> Anybody else before we stop tonight? Yep. In scripture, what's the difference between allegory and finding an allegorical meaning, like you're talking about, and understanding the use of metaphors? And what's the difference? We're, we're going to spend a lot of time on metaphors. We're going to spend a lot of time on figures of speech. Um, again, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of, if, if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense, first part. Um, something else we're going to talk about is in typology, and there's something called types in the Bible, and, and they, we use the word in the Bible, and you've got to know what it means. Some people, and so there's some legitimate that, um, oh, oh, Melchizedek is a type of Christ. Okay, so Melchizedek, we're told in the scripture, and it's like, okay, well, he was a picture of Christ, and isn't that kind of allegorical? Isn't that kind of like the ram caught in the, 
the ram caught in the, in, in the bush, that isn't, isn't that a type of Christ too? And isn't this the type of Christ and that type of Christ and this type of Christ? And, and the principle we're going we're gonna to say is, you know what? Um, if the Bible says it's a type, you should understand it as a type. If the Bible doesn't say it's a type, you should almost certainly not understand it as a type. You know? And so if, if it wants you to go down that road, there'll be, they'll, it, you know, I think the safest thing is let it tell us to go down that road. You know, that's a, there's, there's shades of gray. I wish it was a little bit more scientific. There's shades of gray. But, um, but these are the principles that you put out as boundary markers to keep you from going crazy. Um, so, but we'll spend a lot more time there. So, all right, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we, we thank you that you have endowed us with the capability to, to speak. And Father, that we know instinctually um, that some things are true. We know instinctually that when somebody says something, they're trying to communicate something, one thing. And, 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 and whether they're successful or not, that's their intent, Father, and that, and that we, don't, we don't speak you know, and with 10,000 different meanings um, uh, for, for others. And Father, we know instinctually that, that it is my task not to, not to put whatever meaning I, I, I want into what somebody tells me, but to, but to strain my ears and my understanding to, to hear what they're trying to say. And so, Father, these are, these are things that we need to take to the Scripture. We thank you for that. They're common sense, Father. We're uh, we, we don't desire to import some false, false process on biblical understanding. We, we, we strive to, to, to import a common sense application uh, to the Scripture and, and one that we see within the Scripture itself repeated. And so, so Father, I, I believe we're on solid ground. I pray you would confirm that to us in our minds that we're on solid ground and equip us, Father, to... To, uh, to, to come to your word and, and seek out what it means. And I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.